Good morning, church. It is a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. It's good to be back. It was nice to have a week away. I went to my happy place, which is out in Wyoming. I have some really good friends out there that I love to visit, and it's just such a beautiful part of the country. And I always take like a million pictures and try to bring it home with me. Um, but always good to get some time away and reflect and refresh, and then it's good to come home and be back here with family. So our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. Then the dry land, which his hands have formed. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're going to worship God together with singing. We're going to begin this morning by singing House of the Lord. I invite you to stand if you are able.
morning. Amen? We're going to continue by singing together our God. is that if God is for us, then who could ever stop us? If our God is with us, then what could stand against? What a great promise that is. Amen. Right. We're going to continue by singing praise to the Lord, the Almighty. If you want to follow along in your hymnal, it's hymn number 337. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4.
are joining us on Facebook today, welcome. Please leave us a comment and let us know that you're here. And we're going to take a few minutes to greet those around us in the name of Christ. It's that time. A children's story. Yeah. Any children here? Any children? Come on down. If you're young or if you're young at heart, come on up to the front. Oh, oh. Hey, all girls. Little girls, little girls. Oh, she broke her sit right there. Um, I'm going to uh, get to my story, but first, I brought my lunch with me. <laughs> so, a little bit. Well, I do. Let me see. For breakfast, I'm going to have M&M, or, um, yeah, M&M's. Uh, one isn't enough. I have to have two. Isn't this a good one? Uh, then I think I'll have a couple Twix in a, in a Milky Way. Uh, then for lunch, because see, this says breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah, for lunch, I think I'll have another, oh, Twix, I love Twix. And uh, it's lunch, so I have to have a bigger meal, so there's another M&M. &M. And for dinner, I, you know, I've worked all day, so I need lots of stuff. There. Oh, oh, I love it. There. <laughs> now, if I ate all this every day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, what would happen to me? I, I think you're right. I think you're right. No, it would not be good. And what we're going to talk about today, last week we talked about being a disciple, and sometimes there are things we have to give up. Today we're going to talk about being a disciple, and there's some things you have to limit. Everything has a limit. In Ecclesiastes, and that is a book in the Old Testament, it says that too much of anything is not good. And those who follow God know when too much isn't good. So if I ate all this, if I ate all this all the time, I would die. If I slept all the time, what would happen? It'd be fun, but I wouldn't get anything done. Uh, sometimes we play video games too long, right? Sometimes we talk on our phone too much. Sometimes we play instead of finishing our homework. Remember what we talked about in class, who Sneaky Snake is? Who Sneaky Snake? Satan, yes. He slips into our mind and says, well, this, this is all right. We can do this. But what we need to do as disciples we have to think when something isn't good for us. And when you grow up, the same thing is true. There are some things that aren't good for us that we do too much. 
So let's pray, okay? Dear God, help us to know when what we're doing is not good for us. Perhaps we're playing something too long and not getting done what we need to get done, and we're not honoring you. We say this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, yeah. Would someone like to participate in my lunch? Good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. <laughs> How's everybody doing this morning? Good, good. Well, I just have a couple little things I want to share with you, but I made some notes here. <laughs> uh, it won't take too long, so uh, this isn't really what I want to talk to you about. <laughs> but sometimes it seems like that, just empty pages. We place our faith in the reality that God never changes. We serve a God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God's character, God's justice, God's mercy, God's forgiveness, and God's love for us all will endure, regardless of how this world changes. And I find this comforting. God is never surprised by the changes that take place in this world. We are called as followers of Christ to bring the unchanging message of the gospel to an ever-changing world. The method, methods that worked for our parents may not work for us. The tools that got us to this place may not be the right tools to take us through the next leg of our journey here as a church. We need to dream together. We need to learn together. The reason I read that to you this morning is because we've seen a lot of changes in this church, in our church family, in our church body. Some of them have been pretty tough. But we have been blessed to have Cody and Whitney here to help with our youth. And that's the future of our church. But they can't do it by themselves. It's going to take all of us. Every single person that's sitting here today, and those of you that are listening at home, the biggest need that we have right now for our youth is Cody and Whitney have a session from 5 to 6.30 every Wednesday night. And they like to feed the kids that come here to our church to learn and to be part of something bigger. And we want this to be a safe place for them. We want this to be a fun place for them. And we want to feed their bodies as well as feed their souls. And Cody and Whitney can't do it by themselves. They're doing an excellent job. They've got a good group of kids that are here. And we'd like to be a part of that. And I am asking each one of you today, if you could pick a Wednesday, bring them a meal, stay from 5 to 6.30, and just get to know these kids. It's pretty amazing. It's pretty encouraging. And we need to step up to the plate. Thank you. Thank you. 
Carol. We do have a lot going on here. There's been a lot of change and there's a lot of exciting things happening. We are thankful for, for all of the different ministries that happen here, but we all do need to come along. We need to get involved and make things happen. So I just want to encourage you to think and pray about where God wants you to get involved. At this time, we are going to worship the Lord through our joyful giving. There's a passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 that says, God loves a cheerful giver. So we give our gifts joyfully and cheerfully. We give our gifts knowing that every good gift we have comes from God. And we give a portion back for the ministry of this church. Father in heaven, we thank you for all the good gifts you give us. We thank you that you continue to bless us beyond what we can need or imagine. God, we give back a portion to you for the ministry of this church. We give back a portion out of obedience to your call. We give back a portion to remind ourselves that none of it belongs to us and all of it belongs to you. Give us wisdom in how we use these resources. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are going to uh, take some time to lift our prayers before the Lord. We're going to close this time um, by saying together the Lord's Prayer. If you need the words to that, they are printed in your bulletin. Um, a couple of updates. Uh, last weekend, um, Martha Turnbull went into the hospital, and she had surgery last Sunday, and she is recovering while she is now at the Sheridan Hospital doing some rehab, so we continue to pray for Martha and for a full recovery there. Uh, we continue to pray for Rhonda, I believe. It's true, Rhonda, she's been moved to a new building. Same, same location, new building. Yep. So uh, you can use the same address. I think she's in building C instead of building A. Um, and if you get down to Grand Rapids, feel free to, to visit Rhonda and see how she's doing. We continue to pray for her recovery as well. Good to see you, Donna today. Pray for continued recovery there also. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning loving the feel of the sunlight coming in through the windows and this late warm weather that we're experiencing. As we move into fall and this cooler weather and time to 
go to the orchards and pick apples and drink apple cider and think about pumpkins and football and all those things. God, we are in awe of your creative power. We are in awe of the seasons that we get to experience. God, we come to you this morning worshiping you for your greatness, worshiping you for your creative power, worshiping you because of your love, worshiping you because of your mercy and your forgiveness that you continually pour out on us. God, we come here this morning broken, knowing that we need your mercy and your grace. God, we, we don't come here feeling like we've got it all figured out and we know something that, that everybody else doesn't, that, that we know the answers, and that's why we gather here. We gather here, because, God, because we know that we need you. We gather here because we know that we need to be forgiven, we need to be filled, we need to worship you, we need to hear your word, we need to be fed for the coming week. God, forgive us for the things that we've done this past week where we have failed, where we've fallen short, where we've, we've spoken shortly to those who we care about, where we've missed opportunities to show your love, where we've missed opportunities to reach out and be your hands and feet in our community. God, continue to grow in us that faith and that confidence to remember that your spirit lives in us. That we don't have to do these things in our own power, but you give us that strength. God, remind us every day. God, we're so thankful for all of the ways that you work in our lives. We're so thankful for the gifts that you give us. God, we know when we look around at the world that we are blessed. Some would even say spoiled. We have so many material things. But God, we know that it's not all about the material things either. God, help us to not hold on to those material things too tightly. Help us to remember that those are all gifts from you, gifts to use for your glory. Gifts to further your kingdom. God, help us to continually grow in our relationship with you. So that as we continue to experience your love and your mercy, that that love and mercy just spills out of us into everything that we touch. God, we want to be a people that, that just shares that love and mercy with everybody that we come in contact with. God, help us to be more like you every day. Lord, we lift up to you those in our congregation, in our families, in our community who need your special touch. Whether it's physical healing or mental healing or just your arms of peace around them. God, we, we lean on that promise of Emmanuel, that promise of God with us, that whatever we go through, you are right there with us. Lord, hear us now as we pray the way you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to sing. Uh, we're going to sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. If you want to follow in your hymnals, it's hymn number 98.
I invite you to stand and sing if you're able. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faith. saying good. You may be seated. We are continuing today in our series about the vision for our church, the vision for moving forward for the next seven years. And Cody, if you could put that diagram up there for me. So we talked about the over the horizon vision that God has called us to be a church that grows deeper in our relationship with Jesus in order that we can go out and be the hands and feet of Jesus to our community. That's our main focus as a church. Those are the things that we have discovered and determined that we are passionate about. We want to grow deeper and closer to Jesus, and we want to use that deeper relationship to go out into the community and help meet the community's needs to the best of our ability, whether those are physical needs or spiritual needs or emotional needs. That's our over-the-horizon vision. That's the big picture of where we're going. And, and over the past four weeks, we talked about the four pieces of our background vision, which were community outreach, which were the Sunday morning experience, 
discipleship and meeting people's needs. And those are, those are the big pieces that are going to help us move towards that over-the-horizon vision. And today, Cody, if you could put that back up there for me, please. We're hit, getting to this mid-ground vision, right? That's another one big chunk that goes all the way. And this is our one-year focus. And we determined as a group, there were 18 of us that met to talk about this vision, that for the first 12 months... We want to focus on the Sunday morning experience. What happens here on Sunday morning? And how are we a place where people can experience the living God? How can we be a place that people want to be a part of so that they can grow deeper in their relationship with Jesus and be sent out into the community? So we're just past halfway. We're going to talk again. So we've already talked about the Sunday morning experience, right? We talked about it as part of our three-year goals, and I'm going to talk about it again today. And the reason I'm going to talk about it again today is because this is what we're focusing on for the next 12 months. How do we continue to improve what happens here on Sunday morning? We are a church. We exist to make disciples. And this thing, this, this hour or so on Sunday mornings, this is our main program. This is the main time we gather together every week to talk about Jesus, to worship God, to give of our tithes and offerings, to hear from God's word. This is the main event for us as an organization. Now, we do many other things, and those are important as well, but this is the one place where we all gather together each week. And so we want to make sure that this place, this experience on Sunday mornings is such that people want to be here. That you are so excited about what you're experiencing on Sunday mornings that you want to go out and invite people. And when those people come, they're, they're having an experience here that they want to be a part of and they want to keep coming and they want to invite people to, right? That's what we're about. Now, the last time we talked about this, I said, you know, it's not about the music. It's not about having the best music and having the lights and having a smoke machine and, and creating some kind of, of just an experience, a false kind of experience that, that people can get excited about. And we know that doesn't work because there are churches all over America doing that. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having lights or smoke machines or a big band, right? That works in some settings, and it doesn't work in other settings, but it's not a magic bullet, right? You can go the other way and say, you know, if we just use the organ for all of our music, and we had a very traditional and, and made this a very traditional and liturgical and, and reverent worship service, that that would bring people in. It's not about the music or the color of the carpet, or any of that stuff. Because any of you who have left this country and gone to another country have seen people worshiping on dirt floors with no instruments and no music, and you see them experiencing God in powerful ways. I want to share a story from John chapter 4 today. And first, I'm just going to read through it, and then I'm going to try to unpack it a little bit. So I'm going to read um, most of the chapter. I'm going to read verses 1 through 30 of J John chapter 4. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard, Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized, he left Judea, and he started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, Ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria. 
Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors, our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me. The hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came, and they were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, What do you want, or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? And they left the city and were on their way to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What a story. So Jesus leaves Judea, which is where Jerusalem is, and he, has to, he wants to go back to Galilee. In order to go back to Galilee, he has to pass through Samaria. And it's interesting, you know, there's so many things when we read Scripture that we miss because we don't understand the context. And, and John gives us a little bit of that context, right? He says that Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans, right? So here, Jesus goes to this well, and this Samaritan woman comes out. And Jews were not supposed to speak to Samaritans. They weren't supposed to have any interaction with Samaritans at all. And men were not supposed to have any interaction with women outside of the home. So here Jesus is breaking all the rules. He's talking to a Samaritan, and he's talking to a Samaritan woman at this well. I, I, every time I, I think about the story, I try to think of, a, of, a, of an equivalent. And I don't think we have one. I don't think we have that big of a taboo. It would be like going back to the 1940s in Alabama and a white preacher talking to a black prostitute on a street corner. That's the best analogy I can come up with. That these two people who aren't supposed to be talking to each other are talking to each other. And what, what do we learn just from that piece itself? That Jesus is saying to us, it doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, a Jew or a Samaritan or a Greek or an American or a Chinese person. It doesn't matter. You are all welcome in my kingdom. There is nobody that's on the outside that can't receive the mercy of God. So he has this conversation, and 
and he's talking about living water. He's saying, I have this living water. What does she say? You don't even have a bucket. How are you going to get water if you don't even have a bucket? Right? He's trying to talk about something that she can't see or feel or touch. And she can't get beyond the physical. Right? Again, so often we get lost in these stories. We, we think about the physical world that we interact with and, and the things that we know. And, and Jesus is trying to tell us something about the kingdom of God that is so beyond our comprehension. And he says, I have living water. You'll never thirst again. And they have this, this conversation about, about her husband. He says, go get your husband. Obviously, he's, he's baiting her here, right? And she says, I don't have one. He says, you're right. You've had five. And the guy you're with now isn't even your husband. And I think this is an interesting twist, too, in our, in our current scenario. Because we read that and we think, oh, she must be a very sinful person that she's, she's left five husbands. But you have to remember, in that time, a woman couldn't leave her husband. So she had been left five times. She had been abandoned five times. And we don't know the scenario. We don't know the circumstances of those things. But we do know that women couldn't initiate a divorce. So here's this woman who, A, had been abandoned over and over and over again. And B, I had a B. There was a B in there. I hate it when that happens. It just just goes. What's that? Well, the man she's with, yes. But not only had she she been abandoned five times, but here she was probably an outcast in her community, right? People looked at her and said, oh, she's she's broken. She's she's had five husbands. She's just, whether it's her fault or not, she's an outcast. So it says they met at noon. That's not the normal time for someone to come to the well to drink water. They come in the mornings to drink water while it's still cool, still the coolest of the day. So she's probably coming at noon to avoid the rest of the crowd, to avoid hearing the people talking about her at the well. And she comes out here, and all of a sudden she runs into this guy sitting at the well, and he wants to talk to her. So he says, yeah, you've had five husbands, and now the guy that you're with isn't your husband. So what does she do? She changes the subject, because that's what we would do, right? She says, so, I see that you're a prophet. My people say that we should worship here, right? She wants to take the focus off of her, because nobody wants, nobody wants to talk about their own weaknesses, right? Nobody wants to talk about their own deep, dark, I don't want to stand up here and talk about all my deep, dark secrets. So we change the subject. And she asks him this question, she says, my people say that we're supposed to worship here on the mountain. Mount Gerizim was where the Samaritans worshipped. And your people say that you're supposed to worship at the temple in Jerusalem. Who's right? And what does Jesus say? First he says this. He says, well, salvation comes from the Jews. So you worship what you don't know. We worship what we do know. But rather than leave it there, leave it in that place where the Jews have all the answers and and." It's not for everybody. He says, but a time is coming and has now come where you will neither worship in Jerusalem or on this mountain, but the Father seeks worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. For the Father is spirit and he seeks worshipers who will worship him in spirit and truth. What does that mean? That we have to worship him in spirit and truth. It means, means, A, the place doesn't matter. We don't have to go to the temple. We don't even have to be in this building. We don't have to gather in these pews to worship. We're thankful for this building, that we have this place where we can worship, but this building isn't, it's not about the building. We are the church. When we gather Together, God has promised when two or more are gathered in my name, I will be there with you. When we gather together, whether we gather here or out on the lawn or in our backyard, when we're gathered in Jesus' name, he is here with us. It's not the place. It's not the building. But he says it's in spirit and in truth. 
in truth. What does it mean to worship God in truth? I think about this a lot. So I've spent the last, I don't know how many years, 17, 18, 20 years, doing music and worship in churches. And I spent a lot of time thinking about what songs should we sing. And not what songs should we sing as far as what sounds good or what are people going to like, but what songs have the right lyrics. Do the words match up with God's word? Do the words support the message that the pastor is going to be preaching on this given day? Does the message all move in the same direction? And most importantly, as I said, does it line up with God's word? Because if we're saying and singing and doing things that don't line up with God's word, then we're not worshiping in truth. Right? We can want all kinds of things to be true. But God's word guides us. God's word tells us there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, where does it lead? It leads to death. If you follow your heart, which is what the world tells you to do, follow your heart and everything will be great. And the Bible says follow your heart and it leads to death. We are a broken people and I think we all know this, right? Right? We don't want to admit it, maybe, on the surface, because there are things we want to do in life, and we, we have dreams, and we have desires that we want to accomplish, but we know deep down inside, if we follow our own heart, it's going to lead us to all kinds of dark places. We're going to make all kinds of mistakes. Some of us have made all those mistakes. I've made a bunch of those mistakes. But we know that we can go to God's Word, and we can get real, true guidance and he asks us to worship him in truth so we stick to God's word I try to select always songs that line up with God's word what better way to sing than to sing actual words of scripture right that we use God's word as our guide always and what does it mean to worship him in spirit We've talked a lot over the last year about the fact that God's Spirit lives in us. On the day of Pentecost, the disciples were gathered in the upper room, and for the first time ever, the Spirit of God came and inhabited all of the believers. And Jesus gave that promise right before he ascended into heaven, that the Holy Spirit would come and it would be our comforter and it would teach us and it would help us to understand. It would give us the words to say when we didn't know what to say. We have God's Spirit living inside of us. And here, Jesus tells us that, that we are to worship him in spirit. We're to worship him with every bit of our being. We're not just supposed to worship him intellectually. We're not just supposed to worship him with our voice. We're not just supposed to worship him with our actions. We're supposed to do all of those things together. We're supposed to worship him with every bit of ourselves. We should be pouring our heart and our soul into worship and not just for the hour that we're in this building. One of my favorite verses is Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, that says, Therefore, brothers, in view of God's mercy, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices. That means everything you do 24-7 can be an act of worship. How often do we try to get away from that? We, we have our Sunday life where we come to church and we sing songs and we meet with our church friends and we have coffee together and we do nice things and we have dinner with our family. And then we on Monday, we go into our weekday life. And do those line up with each other? For some of us, maybe yes. For some of us, eh, maybe not. Maybe we act a little bit differently Monday through Saturday. 
Maybe we talk a little differently Monday through Saturday. Maybe we focus on other things Monday through Saturday. And Scripture calls us to give everything we have all the time as a spiritual act of worship. Going to school can be a spiritual act of worship. Getting up in the morning and going to your job can be a spiritual act of worship. Going to the grocery store can be a spiritual act of worship if you do it for the glory of God. If you have your eyes open and you say, God, I don't know what you've got in store for me at the grocery store today, but I'm, I'm here for it. I'm ready. If there's somebody in this grocery store today that needs me to just say a kind word to them or to, to, to put my hand on their shoulder and say, I'm praying for you. Or to stop in the middle of the grocery store and pray for them. If God leads you to do something, be ready to do it. Where is God leading you? And are we listening? Is this not what we've been talking about for the last year? Right, Going through the book of Acts over and over and over again, we saw how God was inhabited in people and he did amazing things through them. And this, the message of Acts is that we all have that gift. We get lost into thinking that we're out here on our own and that, you know, God wants us to do all this stuff, but man, I don't, I don't know how to do any of that stuff. I don't have the strength or the power or the wisdom to do any of that stuff. And you read Acts and you go, oh, I don't have to. Paul didn't have any of that stuff. Peter didn't have any of that stuff. The other disciples, they did. remember that in the Jewish culture, the smartest of the smartest students got chosen by the rabbis to learn. And the rest got sent back to their families to work in the family business because they weren't good enough to learn from the rabbis. What does Jesus do? Jesus comes along and he meets these guys fishing. What are they doing? They're doing the family business. Why are they doing the family business? Because they weren't good enough to learn from another rabbi. And Jesus says, come, follow me. So he takes these guys that weren't good enough. They weren't, they weren't exceptional students. They weren't smart. He did this for a reason, to show us that God will use ordinary, boring, not the smartest person in the room, and he'll use those people to do amazing things just to prove that he can. Just to prove that it's not us. I don't stand in front of you because I'm the smartest person in this room. Some of you know this. I've been fighting with God since I got here. I just want to write a sermon already. And he won't let me. I have not written a sermon in 15 months. And I tell you what, almost every Sunday I get up here and I'm scared to death of what's going to happen. Because I don't know. I'm hearing this sermon for the first time just like you. No joke. I have tried over and over again to sit down at my computer and write a sermon, and he just blanks me out. He's like, nope. I just want you to get up there and trust me. So I do. I study the scripture. I study the passage. I read all the commentaries. But I physically can't write anything down. And he just wants to show me that I can trust him. That it's not about my intellect. It's not about my ability to write some amazing sermon. It's about him in his power, in his strength, using me to tell us what he wants us to hear. How cool is that? And scary. But he wants to use all of us that way. He might not want you to preach on Sunday, but he wants to use you, and he will give you exactly what you need. Because the Spirit of God is inside you. I'm going to keep saying it until we all get it, myself included. The Spirit of God lives inside of you. You have the power of the living God at your disposal. 
And what's required of us? To listen and be willing. That's it. Listen and be willing. Listen to what he says. Listen to where he leads. And when he says, I need you to go over here, you don't make excuses. You don't argue. You close your mouth and you go. And if he says, I need you to talk to that person over there, that young lady over there, she's hurting and she just needs a kind word. Go say a kind word. It doesn't matter if you know her or not or what she looks like or what she's wearing or what she's doing or if she's got kids with her or doesn't have kids with her or if she's crying or if she's laughing. If God tells you to say a kind word, go say a kind word. So how does this relate back to the Sunday morning experience? I'm going to say the same thing I said a couple weeks ago. When we become people like that, when we become people who listen and obey the leading of the Spirit inside of us, watch out because God is going to move through us. He's going to use us. He's going to grow us deeper in our relationship with him so that we can go out into the community and do amazing things. Not in our own power, not because of our own intellect, our own abilities, our own talents, but because of God moving and working in us and through us. There's that song, Fill My Cup, Lord. You know this song? Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. I want to be a cup that is just so overflowing with God's love that everybody I come in contact with they feel that, right? It's just, it, I can't help. Like, like my hands have it all over and, and whatever I touch, it just gets on, right? That it's just spilling out of us and we can't help but get it all over the people that we come in contact with. And he just wants us to listen and obey and go where he calls us. That's our challenge. And when we do that, when we start living that way, when we start answering the call, man, we're going to see amazing things happen. And maybe not amazing things like we're not going to have 300 people in here. I don't know what God has in store for us. But God is going to use us to impact people's lives. He's going to use us to be his hands and feet to change people's lives in this community. I have no doubt that that's what he wants to do in and through us. And all we have to do is listen and go. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are amazing. You are such a good God. I love that we get to go to your word and we see these stories that, that this woman that, that Jesus wasn't even supposed to talk to. It was against the rules for him to talk to her. But he did it anyways to show us that nobody is outside of your love and your mercy and your grace. God, we have so much to learn. God, I continue to pray that you would give us faith, that you would give us confidence, that you would give us courage to close our mouth to open our ears and to hear that still, small voice and to have the courage to follow where it leads. God, give us courage. It's in Jesus' precious name that we pray and all God's people said, amen. Before we uh, join together in communion, we're going to sing one more song. We're going to sing together 10,000 Reasons. I'm going to invite you to stand if you're able, and sing with us.
So I was thinking about communion, and I was thinking about the fact that we, uh, we, we do this live stream thing. So I'm going to encourage you, if you're at home right now, go grab a cracker or a piece of bread. And the closest thing you've got to juice, there's nothing magic about Welch's, but grab something and join us for communion. I invite the deacons to come forward. Jesus gathered together in the upper room with his disciples, and it was Passover. And remember, the Passover was this celebration, this, this feast that the Jews celebrated. They celebrated it to remember that God had passed over. Right? Remember when, when God brought the plagues on Egypt because Pharaoh would not let the Israelites go. 
And the last plague was this plague of the firstborn, that the firstborn of everyone in Egypt died. But God instructed the Israelites to kill a spotless lamb and to paint the blood on their doorposts. And if, if the angel of death came to that household and saw the blood on the doorpost, the angel of death would pass over that house. And no one would die. And so they celebrated. Every year they gathered together to celebrate this Passover meal, this celebration that God had spared them from this horrible, horrible thing. And Jesus gathers with his disciples and he says, I am here to bring a new covenant. He took the bread and he says, this bread is my body, broken for you. And then when they were done eating, he took the cup and he said, he said, this wine, this wine is my blood and my blood is spilled for you. And this is the new covenant. It's the new promise that I'm going to bring. And we know that later that night, Jesus was arrested, and the next day he was crucified. That on that cross, he paid the penalty for our sins. And then he rose again from the dead to conquer death that we could have the promise of eternity with him. And that's what we celebrate in this communion meal together. We're going to pass the bread, take one, and hold on to it. We'll eat it together and then we'll take the cup and do the same. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat.
This cup is the new covenant in Jesus' blood. Take and drink. Father, what an awesome gift this is. This reminder as the Israelites gathered to remember the Passover and how you had protected them and saved them, that Jesus brought a new covenant through the sacrifice of his broken body and his spilled blood. God, help us to remember the power of that sacrifice. God, we thank you for your love. It's in Jesus' precious name and all God's people said, amen. We have just a couple of quick announcements before we go. Uh, we've got a couple of meetings this week. Our vision team is meeting Tuesday night at 6.30. Our women's prayer group meets Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock. Um, we have our annual congregational meeting coming up October 22. That is three weeks from today. Important meeting, please plan to stay after worship for a while. We do this one time a year. We're going to talk about the budget. We're going to talk about committees. We have a lot to talk about in the life of the church. So please plan to attend that meeting. Um, we do have a couple of openings on committees. If you are interested in either serving as the vice moderator or as an auditor, you can talk to Don Wadel or you can call the office and let Jody or myself know that you're willing to help there. And Halloween is coming up. We're going to do some trick-or-treating, as we do in the community. So plan um, to be here on Halloween from 5 to 7 to help hand out candy. If you can um, donate candy, there's a basket out there for donations, and financial donations can help there as well. Betty Brayman is kind of heading that up if you want to talk to her with any questions. As you leave here today, go in the knowledge that God calls us to worship him in spirit and in truth, and he gives us everything that we need to follow him. His spirit lives in us and empowers us. Go in peace. Amen.